Thank you. Uh, thank you for settling down so quietly. Um, it's, it's, gonna, it's a really heady uh, couple of days with lots of great conversations, so I hope those conversations continue. Um, I, my name is Asma Malik. I'm a uh, professor at the Ryerson School of Journalism and the associate director of the Ryerson Journalism Research Center. I am also um, a, a veteran uh, local news journalist, uh, working, having worked here in Toronto and at uh, the Gazette in Montreal. Um, so I'm very invested in um, in today's panel and all of the all of the presentations that uh, we're going to be a part of in the next few days. Um, I'm delighted to be moderating this panel, which is called "Does Local News Matter: Tales from the Trenches." Understanding local journalism and why it matters is essential to really understand news and journalism um, in this day and age. And our panel our panelists reflect varied perspectives on the impact of local news from their role as researchers, city councillors, community activists, and media professionals. So um, I will be introducing the panelists um, right off the top, and then they will present similar um, to what we did in the previous uh, panel. And then we'll have time for questions um, after that. So uh, let's get things started, keep things on schedule, keep April, uh, <laughs> keep April happy. Um, so first off, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Christy Hess. Um, from Deakin University in Melbourne. She's a senior lecturer in communication and she researches local journalism and community media. Her work has been published in leading journalism, media, and communications journals. Her rec she recently co-authored the book, Local Journalism in a Digital World. It offers insights for students and scholars working in and investigating local journalism in today's digital world. She has also worked as a journalist and is the academic director of Australia's largest university industry training program for practicing post-cadet journalists. Christy is an editorial board member of the international journal, Digital Journalism. Uh, following Christy, we'll have James Gordon, who is a municipal councillor for the city of Guelph, which has had a pretty interesting history with its um, daily newspaper. Uh, he was elected a member of the city council in Guelph in 2014. Uh, he's seen the lo local news landscape in his city change significantly in the past few years after the 149-year-old Guelph Mercury published its last edition in January 2016. The Mercury was one of Canada's oldest daily newspapers. He's an advocate and community builder in Guelph and has received the Mayor's Award for Community Service in 2008. He has also earned an international reputation as a playwright, songwriter, record producer, music educator and performer. He has recorded 40 albums and toured the world with his music. Brian Lambie is president of Red Brick Communications and Media Relations, and, and, he's, sorry, and he's the media relations contact for the Association of Municipalities of Ontario. He's the founder and president of Red Brick Communications, a public relations agency in Mississauga, Ontario. Since 2003, he has also served as the media contact for the Association of Municipalities of Ontario. And he is the former vice president of Howe & Company Corporate Communications. His specialties include corporate and public sector communications, issue crisis management, and media relations. And our last, last but certainly not least panelist is Nia Singh. He's a community activist, human rights advocate, and Juris Doctor articling at Dallas Criminal Defense here in Toronto. He has been a high profile activist demanding an end to carding, which is the police practice of randomly stopping and questioning black and indigenous people in Toronto. In 2015, he launched a constitutional challenge against Toronto police, as well as a human rights tribunal complaint in 2016. He is the past president and co-founder of the Osgood Society Against Institutional Injustice at York University, and has been a go-to source for journalists writing about racial profiling by police. He was awarded the Dean's Gold Key in 2016, award given to graduates from York University's Osgood Hall Law School for his exemplary contribution to the law school community. So please join me in welcoming today's panelist. Christy, we'll start with you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation to uh, be here this weekend, to April in particular. Um, this is an incredibly important discussion for scholars and industry professionals to have. 
in this period of digital disruption. Just a disclaimer, I'm incredibly jet lagged. <laughs> um, I've come from Australia and uh, it's a 20 hour flight and I arrived last night. So if I don't make sense, please forgive me, I'm trying my, my very best. Um, I thought that uh, in order to set the scene today, we might start with a sprinkle of comedy, just to put this whole discussion into, uh, into context. Now, I'm not a comedian, especially with jet lag, so I'm going to leave that to uh, Michael McIntyre, who is a comedian, uh, in his discussion, or his sketch, on media and technology. So just bear with me for a minute. And you go there, you drag a little man over the map, and you drop him into the road, and then you're there. You can see it. It's really amazing technology. And you sit in front of the computer, you think, I can go anywhere, anywhere in the world. Where should I go? And we all have the same conclusion my house. <laughs> loved that and I just I, I had to share it so I'm not going to ask you to put your hand up if you've ever checked your house or street on Google Earth because I'm betting at least some of you have McIntyre makes the important observation that while we can seek information about anywhere we like on earth with the click of a button we are still particularly intrigued by our local environment and a desire to understand how where we live fits into the context of the big wide world. We can learn a thing or two from people like McIntyre, even though he's a comedian, who observes and listens to people at the everyday level. My own research involves asking people what they say and do about local news to give insight into its significance in the changing digital world. How people navigate their way around the information superhighway is intriguing and speaks of unspoken issues of power. In digital networks, for example, some news nodes look brighter to us than others and have more appeal. The reasons for this are very complex and go to the heart of some of the questions that I will discuss here today. I've thought a lot about conceptualising the local in the digital world and suggests that local media need to be examined in a geosocial framework. Firstly, geography isn't dead. I have heard it a thousand times um, in industry, in the streets, um, and, and it's just not dead. So geography is, is a central component to understanding local news, but it needs to be um, understood also in the context of global flows and movements. And it's so far proving quite a useful concept for scholars in tracing networks in a local global context. Today, though, I want to talk about another conceptual idea. Forget about the hamster for a minute. Um, and how it relates to why local news matters. It's about the power that comes from connecting people with each other. And to me, this is absolutely fundamental to the future of local media. So to demonstrate this, I want to turn to our, uh, our attention to the world and our friend of Facebook. The way I see it is that Facebook is the hamster of the media landscape. Apologies to those of you who keep hamsters as pets. Please do not take this personally. When it first became part of the digital landscape, Facebook was treated much like the hamster. So cute, so harmless. So friendly, something journalists were very curious about, wanted to pat and befriend. Terms like the fifth estate, social journalism, social networking as tools for journalistic connectivity have all become commonplace in the scholarly literature. Facebook 
was providing the uncontested platform for people to connect with each other socially. <laughs> but did you know the hamster has cannibal-like tendencies? especially when it comes to protecting territory. It's pretty horrific, just like this. Isn't it a great photo? I found it on Google. <laughs> they will eat their species if they feel threatened and to maintain their dominance in a given space. Cannibalism is becoming a popular term in discussions about Facebook and local news at home in Australia. There is currently a Senate inquiry into the future of public journalism and several politicians have Google and Facebook firmly in their sights. They say Facebook is cannibalising local news content and, uh, and are not subjected to the same set of social responsibilities as traditional media providers. They are particularly concerned, obviously, about the effect on local media and the impact on advertising. So to me, there are some valuable lessons from the rise of Facebook that I don't think are fully appreciated in scholarly and industry circles about local media. The Facebook philosophy to connect people with each other is clearly a good one because Mark Zuckerberg is now a multi-billionaire at a time when the business model of news has crumbled. Compare this to the journalistic philosophy of objectivity, to be outside society, to stand back in order to report the truth. A valuable concept, don't get me wrong, but there's more to local news than this. Scholars such as Nick Cauldry in the UK highlight that the battle to serve as central to the social is real and intensifying. Facebook tells us how important the social realm is to our daily lives. To illustrate this, there's a Facebook phenomena that is generating plenty of friends and likes in local communities around the world. Buy, sell and swap pages are probably serving a town or city somewhere near you. They provide a platform for people linked to a specific geographic area to sell and exchange their wares. Take for example the Long Island site in the US where member Jeff is selling his second hand Xbox and Lynn has some designer handbags up for grabs. What's most interesting to me however is the rise of emerging practices on these pages outside their original intentions. On one page, a woman has called out for her lost dog. Someone wants to find the person who hit his car outside the supermarket. It's happened to me, but I didn't put it on by sales well. <laughs> and uh, there's also a plea to find an engagement ring lost at a swimming pool. More importantly, people have even started announcing the arrival of new babies and wedding anniversaries. This exchange of news and information in its grassroots form is an exemplar of what Durkheim would call organic solidarity and it's making social media sites like Facebook powerful as they become increasingly central to our social lives. Buy, sell and swap pages are snazzy digital versions of the 18th century newspaper, an era when shipping notices, newspaper um, uh, properties for lease and goods for sale dominated the front pages. People's appetite for this basic type of information shouldn't be overlooked. Rituals such as births, deaths and marriages, for example, are by far one of the most significant dimensions of local news and yet underappreciated in scholarship about the media. Local news proprietors regularly boast about how they use Facebook as a promotional tool, putting up teasers of stories to protect the serious journalism and direct people back to their websites. But many leave the social dimensions of local life to their Facebook pages, from audience engagement to information about upcoming social events. This only reinforces the significance of Facebook to our social lives. A newspaper in Australia, for example, recently ran a business story about Facebook being a threat to local news advertising. But in the very same issue, it ran an obituary about a local cartoonist and at the bottom of the story said, to leave a condolence message, please refer to our Facebook page. The recent announcement that Facebook will train local journalists in the US 
is evidence that they are building growing legitimacy off the back of news media providers. Facebook is a social networking tool with no serious moral obligation to its users. Local news outlets matter like they have never mattered before because they should have a moral dimension to what they do. Journalists must increasingly serve as respected moderators and umpires in public discussions and often they play a role in shaping perceptions of what is right and wrong in the communities they serve. And people expect local media to serve as a moral compass and as leaders of the geographic areas they serve. So the central message I really want to get across today is that the power to connect people is so important. And to me, it's a vital concept that should drive our understanding of local journalism in the 21st century. In my own work, I um, refer to this as what I call mediated social capital. And it does resonate with, um, with what Michelle was talking about in the, in the first session today. Social capital is largely considered a political or community level resource but it is a resource of power that can be used by those in a position to leverage it. Local news matters because done properly, it provides the best illustration of how this plays out. There are three forms of mediated social capital, bonding, bridging and linking. Bonding is the ability of news media to generate a sense of community and to provide a connection to people's individual sense of place and belonging. Local knowledge is an essential component of helping to foster this. So when I was first invited to speak here in Toronto, I did a Google search on local news providers. And I came across a website called Narcity, outlining the 22 places in Toronto with nicknames that only Torontarians, <laughs> let's call them locals, <laughs> would know. There was The Village, Due West, The Danny, Scarves, the Avondab, the Peanut, the Bird's Nest and the Shoe. Now none of these are familiar to me but I imagine they are to, to some of you. I, I heard a little trickle of laughter and it gives us a warm sense of familiarity. Local knowledge sounds simple and straightforward yet many news conglomerates have taken for granted this basic assumption and are centralising resources and losing this valuable insight in the process. In Australia, media owner Fairfax made the ludicrous decision to centralise its front of house administration at some of its local newspapers. When people called up to speak to a journalist to place a funeral notice, they were directed to a call centre in the Philippines and often asked to spell out the names of popular streets, even the towns where they lived, so their query could be directed. In outlining bonding social capital, it's also important to note that it has a dark side. The creation of community means there's always a centre and periphery, and news providers must work hard to ensure they serve the interests of all. Bridging and linking, meanwhile, define the power of news media to actively connect people with each other, horizontal and vertical ties, or framed in terms of peers versus power. Let me be more specific. I'm going to share two news stories about bicycles written by journalists working uh, from different corners of the globe. The first relates to a man living in a small Australian town who is restoring some old bicycles that he plans to give children living in remote Indigenous communities. At the end of the interview, the journalist asks if he's seeking more bikes. He shrugs and says, oh, well, I suppose. And the journalist includes his phone number at the bottom of the story and says, yes, if you'd like to donate a bike, go here. Several days later, the man contacts the journalist in mock horror. Mate, what have you done? I've got a hundred bikes sitting on my front lawn. <laughs> About the same time in the United States, a local news outlet serving Fort Myers in Florida begins a campaign to improve safety for local cyclists. A journalist there writes a story about road accidents involving bikes. She is inspired to set up a Share the Road community page on Facebook, inviting visitors to join the newspaper's campaign. The community has since raised money to distribute bike lights to those in need, and local hospitals and politicians have joined the cause to preach for road safety. To be the beacon in the night, 
that connects people dates back to de Tocqueville's theory of democracy. We should also note that the social dimensions of our lives serve as a precondition for political action and, motiva and, and motivation. Fostering this is as important for news media as its valuable fourth estate function. Local news matters because while anyone can broker connections, some people and institutions are looked to first and foremost to achieve this on behalf of their community. Social media campaigns can be hugely successful, but often they depend on attention and traction from news media to gain lift off. A retired man in an Australian town last month was so sick of the poor train, uh, train timetables and, and quality of transport that he called a public meeting via Facebook to discuss the issue. He got so many likes. Good on you, Peter, they said. Hundreds of likes. Good on you. Three people came to his meeting. When the local newspaper called a public meeting on the issue several weeks later, borrowing from this man's idea, they had 150 people, including local politicians. And so I may have begun today with a comedy sketch that I really found funny, I'm glad you did too, about the local and the global. But this is such a serious issue. Local news matters. In fact, when it comes to our everyday social lives, it matters most. And some blatant self-promotion. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm a politician and I can't be contained by what PowerPoints present. Uh, it's great to see you and I'm delighted to be invited and I'm imagining that one reason I was invited is because as was mentioned, uh, my town of about 130,000 people now um, had its 149 year old newspaper close last year and it became a news story about the death of local news. So it helped to amplify exactly what you're talking about in this wonderful conference, and in fact, there's some great visuals. If I had a presentation, I would have put them up about uh, the, the day that the newspaper died. Um, it became a, a, a spontaneous wake outside the offices of the Guelph Mercury, and it grew and grew and grew. People were gathering because they didn't know what to do with it, and they realized, as we are realizing here at this conference, that that newspaper was part of their family. Um, and one thing that I'll delve into later, they didn't know what to do with that. They were mourning, they were grieving, they didn't know what would come next. But I bet you that only a very small percentage of those people were actual subscribers to the newspaper, which indicates part of the problem. Um, uh, a little bit about my hometown. Yes, we do have about 130,000 people. We often win accolades as having the best quality of life in the country. We're known for our vibrant culture and our leadership around innovation and environmental issues. In fact, we've been in the news of late as being the epicenter of the fight against bottled water <laughs> um, because we have a Nestle bottling plant right outside our city limits. Um, we have the lowest unemployment rate in the country and the lowest vacancy rate in housing often listed as one of the top 10 places to live. We're known for being fairly progressive politically, though we have currently have a mayor who identifies more as libertarian and then won his position on a platform of zero tax increases. And even just listening to my bio as you did, the fact that my city would elect a hippie folk singer to council is an indication of what kind of city and the different tensions that we have there. Um, so, uh, the progressiveness that we're known for, and one of the reasons I wanted to speak to you is that it's not now, that progressiveness is not now visible in what is left of our local news coverage. Um, why did those people mourn the loss of the Guelph Mercury? I think there was a sense of tradition and trust attached to it. It was acknowledged as our main source of information and commentary and was seen as fair, nonpartisan. If not, I, I won't make a comment on how compelling journalistically it was, but nonetheless, we were drawn to it uh, almost as, as if it was a trusted member of our family. 
Uh, I actually, on a personal note, I was a stringer reporter for the Guelph Mercury when I was 17 years old, covering a rural area outside the town. I got paid by the inch, and I got $5 for a picture. <laughs> um, more recently, I was on the community editorial board of the paper and was able to witness a bit from the inside the slow death of this legendary local resource. It was independent most of its life. After being bought out and flipped a few times, clearly just a pawn in big corporate games, the Torstar Corp Corporation bought it. And I believe, and this could be challenged, that what ensued was a slow death by attrition. Cutbacks in staff and local reporting with content increasingly coming from the nearest city with another Torres Star paper, Kitchener-Waterloo. A lot of good jobs were lost too as the printing and distribution side was all farmed out. There's a theory uh, that readership was deliberately driven down so that closing it could be justified. So it's hard to say if its demise was really due to its irrelevancy in a changing world in journalism or due to corporate greed and neglect. When a paper cuts its budget for real reporting, it's as good as dead as an effective local media source. You may have noticed a trend that certainly was the case in Guelph, but when any paper was lo locally owned, uh, and ours was for over 100 years, I think that there was a sense with the owners that their papers were a public trust, held for public good, um, and it speaks to, uh, I'm noticing if there's a tension, uh, progressive versus regressive on my city council, it involves short-term versus long-term thinking. The short-term thinkers are looking for that quick tax break, not thinking of what the impact would be later. The long-term thinkers, I think, were the owners of those papers um, because they knew that they were building loyalty, uh, all allegiance, and trust whether or not, and so that was a long-term vision of building a, a profit. It was profitable for a long time. Um, when the Mercury became just a, another branch plant of a larger corporation, uh, I think that that obligation to the community gradually became eroded. Um, to many, the Mercury did seem antiquated, not very hip, and it appealed to an older demographic, those who still read actual hard copy newspapers. And yet, when it died, there was this feeling like Joni Mitchell's song, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. Uh, we are now in that stage of grieving and looking more deeply at what will replace it. So what has replaced it um, we have something called Guelph Today, which is an online paper. I don't know, can you call them papers when they're online? But, um, but it's also a, a large corporation that has branches of it around. And their mandate never really was in-depth journalism. So I would say it's very important also to make the distinction that we might have local coverage, but because the style of journalism has, has changed, looking for that based on our, our last excellent presentation around that quick sound bite that we would be more commonly seeing on social media. Um, that's not the goal, and I think we're only discovering now the value of that kind of in-depth and nonpartisan journalism that, that really does seem to be missing. Um, also, it's changed the demographics, the older generation that are less computer savvy and were reliant on their daily paper are feeling left out. They don't know where to turn. There are a few local blogs that try hard but struggle for steady readership. I would say personally the biggest impact politically with the advent of the online paper is that it has become a troll's paradise. And that's not unique to Guelph. Bullying and name calling has a daily unchecked forum and that's bad news for us politicians. We are sitting ducks. Um, and I think that the, this online paper, we are encouraged, we live in a culture now, we're witnessing it to extremes south of the border, that it's okay to lie, it's okay to use alternative facts, that's become the norm. Um, and it's okay from that position of anonymity with the online comment section, which seem to be read um, more voraciously than the actual stories in the online papers, it's okay 
uh, with that protection to be pretty brutal to be a bully. Um, I haven't quite figured out why, and maybe you have insights into that, that when you see uh, those online sections, um, the, the comment sections, it seems to be, politically speaking, the most right-wing extremists that will respond with their comments. They get first in, so they get the largest and most noisy voice. And it's really skewed from my standpoint as a politician. I'm not sure why, if there's a left or if there's a more centrist view, why they don't respond unless to think, just like me, if I respond, I get beaten down immediately by those extremist voices. Um, I'll, I'll just quickly mention, um, uh, there's an actual quote from a right-wing blog that's gained a lot more traction just because the Mercury closed and they didn't want, they didn't know where to go. Um, so where, where is this cool quote? Um, oh yes, Mr. Gordon, you state your job as a counselor is to advocate for such vital issues as housing, poverty, a living wage, food security, environmental sustainability, and climate change. Stop right there. Those items described as vital are not the responsibility of city council. And there's a narrative that develops that we're just uh, activist shit disturbers if we're trying to be progressive and we're not carrying out the agenda that that right wing is pushing and pushing quite successfully with uh, their alternative journals too. Um, so what it means to me personally is that the bad guys win. And that's why there is a greater movement to examine what we lost with our local journals. Um, I'm not sure what we can do about it, but I, I had a great time of being interviewed by a couple of folks who were here yesterday. I sort of turned the tables and was interviewing them when I realized that my other job that was mentioned uh, as a huge international rock star um, <laughs> is that in my job, nobody buys CDs anymore. They expect it for free. In your job as journalists, increasingly you're expected to do your job for free. We are not valuing our artists, our creative sector, and our journalists. So that's why it's not economically viable to create a local newspaper anymore. So the education factor has to be, let's show people the value, like we recognized in that little wake for our newspaper. Let's show people why we need to value, and that has to have an economic value and a cultural value and a community value to build that resource that we need for that balanced journalism and to stay a vital part of the fabric of our community, a fabric that gets lost, and I'm witnessing it every day in my community. It's lost without that balanced journalism. Thank you. Thank you so much, James. And um, now we have Brian Lambie. Thanks a lot. That was a really uh, helpful segue, actually. Uh, so I've been taking calls from, used to be the Guelph uh, Mercury and papers like that for 15 years right across Ontario, usually on government stories or complicated matters that uh, require some context or explanation. I want to take a quick poll of who's in the room. Uh, work with me here. Uh, can you raise your hand if you live in the 416 area code? So most of the room, probably about half. Uh, how about the 905 area code? All right, and then who's from somewhere else other than Kawartha Lakes we know? All right, uh, tell me, where are you from? How far afield? Cleveland. 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 Ah, there we go, nice, all right. Okay, beautiful. It's, it's like a wedding. Okay. That, that's helpful for me to know as I go through it and some of the definitions that I'm going to use. So we're a public relations firm. We, uh, we got somewhere along the line, we got kidnapped by the municipal sector. Uh, there's a good chance over the years that if you live in Ontario, we've probably done something in a community uh, related to you. Uh, and so we always say that if a local media contacts uh, local or, or is working on a local story, they'll often come to us for a provincial perspective. Unless it's in Toronto, then they won't. So when Rob Ford, when we were thinking about changing the Municipal Act to deal with Rob Ford, uh, 
that would involve changing legislation for 3,300 other people. No one came to the Municipal Association for a comment on, on what the implications would be on that, despite a year's worth of intense coverage, which you'll recall. Um, so it's observations that I found over the years, and I don't mean to be rude, it's just what I'm seeing, and some of that's already been described by what was just captured. Uh, there's fewer newsrooms, there's fewer reporters. Uh, we used to live in an age where accuracy was absolutely important to journalism. I have a master's degree in journalism, that's what I was taught. Uh, the fact of the matter now, uh, speed trumps accuracy. I always joke that if, uh, the, you know, uh, 10 years ago, if the Globe and Mail said that uh, Neil Young was dead and he wasn't, uh, that reporter would get terminated from the Globe and Mail and sent to the Toronto Sun or something like that. Sorry, had to. Um, in this day and age, it would be on Twitter. Globe and Mail reporter would qualify and say, we're hearing reports that Neil Young has died. Neil Young will tweet back, what are you talking about? The internet will have a little chuckle. It's a bit embarrassing for the reporter, but life goes on. And it just speaks to the fact that speed is more important now. There's certainly less research, and just think of those stories you've seen that are really just an article that captures a whole bunch of, of tweets, random tweets, and it's presented as, a, as an article. That's not news in any way, uh, but uh, we see a lot more of that sort of thing. We see more columnists and opinion pieces. You certainly see that on television. It's cheaper, it's easier. Uh, they're certainly more inclined to run content from others. So in the dying days of the Guelph Mercury, if I sent them a photograph, they would run it. Whereas 10 years ago, they would object to that. Uh, so in this day and age, it's expected. You use the example of Metroland. Most Metroland uh, it covers a lot of communities now throughout Ontario. And certainly, you'll see lots of tags under there, sourced photographed, meaning it was supplied by someone else. And then, of course, we see all this convergence. So it doesn't matter if you go to the CBC website, CBC radios, uh, CTV television, Globe and Mail, uh, you know, at all their websites sort of look the same. I would say increasingly what you're gonna see, a lot of people say what comes next. I think what's gonna co come next is, you know, my wife works for Enbridge Gas, I work with a lot of governments. I think what comes next is increasingly corporate and government websites are gonna start to look like media websites and newsrooms will move in house. And that may sound insidious to you, but I would argue to you that an emotionally charged, misinformed conversation is worse than a, than a it, worse for an, an organization like a government to manage than a factual conversation. So there is actually uh, a, a desire for governments and large organizations to make sure that they're at least dealing with people who have a basic understanding of what's right and what's wrong in terms of not morally, factually. All right, I wanna give you the example of Midland, Ontario. Midland, Ontario is a community of about 15,000 people. Next door is Penetang with 10,000 people. So the Midland Mirror used to be the paper that would cover 25,000 people. There was another paper as well, I can't remember it, they're gone. That's been uh, uh, replaced with a single Metroland reporter who covers it somewhat on Simcoe.com. Uh, these are the last moments of the Guelph Mercury uh, sort of captured that story. Um, what's taken up in its place is this single reporter that's kind of blended in with these stories and local blogs which cover municipal politics. So those local blogs, uh, if we uh, look at who's behind this, we don't really know. It's more right-leaning, the first one that appeared, that's who they are. Um, they won't tell you who they are, but they were more right-leaning and they were successful in getting more right-leaning candidates on council. So there, a left-leaning blog comes to take its place. That left-leaning blog is, uh, we think it's being run out of the police station. We think, it is, uh, we think it is an IT manager within the police station, which means it's being run with the approval and understanding of the police. And one of the hot topics there is whether or not they should get rid of the Midland Police Force and replace it with the OPP. As you might have guessed, there's a lot of stories that say we shouldn't. Um, all the sort of journalistic ethics that you take to know are, are certainly not captured here. If you ask them who you are, you won't find out. By the way, the municipality can't hold them accountable because they're accountable to a police services board, if that is in fact what's going on. All right, so in this, it allows for fake news to crop up, which is a problem for everybody, most of all you folks. Um, so just a little anecdote story really quick. 
We put out a thing where we have monitored social media use by municipalities across Ontario for the last seven years or so. Well, this year we put out a top 10 list of mayors. Twitter seemed to like it. Uh, they came out with this. New data shows Canada mayors stack up in terms of Twitter followers, mentions, and engagement. And I thought, wait a minute, Twitter stole our idea. Could Twitter steal our, like, our little idea with big Twitter? Um, but I thought, you know, there's an opportunity here. What makes news? News is what people talk about. Change, controversy, human interest, those are the ingredients. We need to have all news is local. Fine, let's start to apply those principles. We need to find an error. So I spoke to my colleague, find a mayor who should be on this list that isn't. And we found one right away. It is, uh, I'm going to skip ahead there a bit. It's Jeff Lehman, mayor of Barrie, should have been on the list. But Twitter only looked at the top 25 largest towns in Canada. Barrie's number 34, roughly. So he didn't make the list. He would have bumped Ma Mayor Crombie from Ottawa off the list. That's also juicy. So if we can go back, I put together a quick email, not a news release or any of that sort of stuff. Uh, subject line, Mayor Lehman, short change by Twitter survey. Uh, I sent it to a guy, because if I send it to local media, they're going to say, oh, PR hack, don't go with him. So I sent it to the, a local communications person who needs to build relationships with reporters. You do that by giving them stories that have nothing to do with you. So when you need to talk to them about asset management, they'll listen. So I said, Twitter just released list of top 10 mayors on Twitter. Here's the link, so it's verifiable. Barry's mayor has more follows than two of the top 10, but he's not there because they did their top 25. That's mean. Barry's probably 34. Notice I qualified it because I like to be accurate. As you know, shameless plug, we do our social media survey. What happens? So we also, these are the photos we sent. Three screen captures which show the numbers. And then we engage the mayor of Barry because we need to get some local, get the local fervor going. We like Twitter Canada's top 10 most followed mayors in Canada. We feel a bit bad for Mayor Jeff, though. We have a little emoji, so we'll keep it light. And sadly, the Toronto Star now uses emojis to send out updates, because there's no hope for us. <laughs> so the mayor wades in, amazingly. And then amazingly, Twitter wades in. So, and they confirm that they stole our idea. Likewise, we're big fans of your social media studies here, too. So what comes down in terms of the media coverage within a, less than a day? Mayor Lehman, short change by Twitter survey. That's my headline with a question mark. <laughs> Barry's, look, they took out the qualifier. Barry is 34 on the list. They don't know that. Uh, Lehman's tweet, two mayors on Twitter top 10, like all the, the we sent them that. Now, this was covered by the Barry Examiner. It was covered by CTV News. Neither of them contacted us to find out if it was real. Barry Advance contacts us. We get this coverage. And then this story gets shared, much of the Guelph example, gets shared across southwestern Ontario. There were important stories in southwestern Ontario that should have been covered that day, but they weren't because this took the place of it. It's not fake news. It's all real, but it's entirely manufactured. Now, that seems like a light story. But we've done the same thing with the Queen's Park Press Gallery, which is now smaller than the Toronto Press Gallery, by far. And I will give you one last thing to think of here. We looked at the GTA section of the uh, Toronto Star over the past week, because it covers 905. Well, here's what that looks like. Of the front section and the DG GTA section, 7% of the stories were about the 905 area co code. More people live in the 905 area code than live in the 416 area code by about half a million people. The GTA section, you would think, is where you'll find these stories. 81% of those are 41, 416 stories in the past week, and there was at least one day when there was no 905 stories. So all of this is a form of, of news poverty as well, I would say. All right, thanks. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, I'd now like to welcome Mia up to speak. Um, we have slides for you, right? Well, thank you. I didn't expect that. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, 
Okay, well, greetings, everyone. Um, thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm going to be speaking about how local news has really affected a major uh, social issue in this country and has basically gone national. Um, and I really want to thank all you journalists out here because without you, um, social change wouldn't happen. So that's just something to keep in mind. So my first part of this may be a little bit difficult because I just realized maybe half the audience is not from the GTA. So I just want to see a show of hands again, who's from the GTA? Okay, so we're about half. So this first part of my presentation is just to put this into context on how effective local news is and what it does to the community. And um, if any international people here know the answers, that's great and you can chime in. So I'm gonna ask you, who are the following people? Um, I'll put the picture up for a few seconds and just raise your hand if you know their first and last name. Okay, that's the first one. That's Jane Kreba. Put your hand up if you know their first and last name. Okay. A few less people. That's Jordan Manners. Put your hand up if you know this person. Right? A bit more than Jane Kreba. That is Sammy Atim. And then put your hand up if you know this person. Again, one or two people. That's Jermaine Carby. So rest in peace to all of those people that I put their pictures up. They were all unfortunately um, killed by a gun in, in the GTA over the past 10 years. And the reason why I point this out is because your first and your third had the most respondents. And that's because there was a lot of media coverage around them. And the second and fourth had some media coverage but not to the extent. So it makes us realize that the more something is covered locally is the more people understand and connect with the issue. And if you're not covering a story, your community's not connecting. What you're presented with on a regular basis becomes your reality. So I'm gonna show you a couple pictures and you'll just get a, a feeling once you see them. Right, that's from the G20 summit. You see thugs, right? So now a whole bunch of thoughts come to your mind when you see thugs. And you're, you're painting your picture behind the scene. When in fact, the G20 was really, you know, we know what it was, but the protest around it was about social justice, was about the 1%. And, it, and it's really not about thugs, but this is the image we get from the G20. Next we have this, dead in the hood. You have a person whose life was taken, but yet they're framed as dead in the hood. Aspiring rapper gunned down. So now there's a disconnect between that person's life, whether they were somebody's son, whether they were a parent, whether they went to school, whether they were trying to make a better life for themselves or anyone around them. It's just an image and then a context and a stereotype that's now permeated through the community. Now this one's kind of funny because um, I'm featured in it. <laughs> but the, the caption says devastating and unacceptable. Um, this is a very important piece which sparked uh, the, the carding changes that we have now. But um, you know, juxtapositioning and journalists know that the words you use and the pictures you put beside it, again, creates an image. So uh, unfortunately, a few of my friends were really shocked when they saw this and they thought something had happened to me or had done something devastating or unacceptable. <laughs> <laughs> the context of this is that after this report came out where the Toronto Star and Jim Rankin and Patty Windsor um, did an investigation on disproportionate stops in Toronto, um, they presented it to the chair of the police board, Dr. Alec Mukherjee. And Dr. Alec Mukherjee's response was, this is devastating and unacceptable. So it was a positive, um, it was a positive headline um, and you'd have to read it to really get that. But this is just how, how many works, as we know. So I'm gonna take you through a trip on how the news affected carding and how carding progressed and the, the changes in the regulations. Um, and I also wanna preface, for me, carding is, is, is not just carding. It's something called arbitrary detention. And arbitra arbitrary detention is a section nine violation of our Canadian constitution. So it's a very serious matter. And it's, it's when people who are innocent or not 
doing anything wrong are stopped. If you're stopped arbitrarily and demanded information or searched, that is a very, very major violation to our democracy and what we call to be free in the world. Um, but this is something African Canadians and indigenous people across this nation have been facing for centuries. So this story came out in 2002. And I think most people in the GTA would think the carding debate and racial profiling has only been an issue over the past three to five years. But this is 15 years ago. And it just shows you that journalists were onto it and they were reporting about it. But for some reason, the story wasn't connecting on a long-term basis. Um, and and this, is, this is a story that was really sparking the STARS analysis on racial profiling. This is another headline, um, 2010, when good are swept up with the bad. And this starts to introduce how uh, innocent people are being stopped all the time, um, arrested, charged, searched, interrogated, um, along with people who are, are criminals or have a criminal history. But the disproportionate effects were immense. Um, you know, you could say for every 100,000 people you stop, you might get one um, charge or arrest. And, and that's just a disproportionate activity in the, in the city and in the country. Again, um, this is a story from 2010, 2011, I believe. And it's talking about how the police strategy targets um, violent areas. So this is shortly after the um, unfortunate shooting of Jane Kriba, where the province had initiated a, a something called TAVIS, where the Toronto Anti-Violence Intervention Strategy, where police officers had no specific division, but they'd be going around to communities and stopping people in an attempt to reduce violence. But what was happening is they were stopping innocent people, violating their rights, demanding information, and doing illegal search and seizures. Um, this is an example of what happened in Neptune Drive after a group of four youth just came back from a Know Your Rights presentation where they were instructed that if you're stopped for no reason, you don't have to provide information to the police. Um, fortunately, this incident was caught on video where you see four young men walking from their community center and then the police pull up and they immediately stop and, and block their way and start talking to them. And then one youth says, you know, um, do I have to stay here? Am, am I being arrested? He says, no, you're not being arrested. He says, well, I'm going to leave. As he tries to leave, the officer pulls him to the ground, punches him, and draws his firearm and points it at him. And then the rest of the kids are on the ground. And um, again, this was major news for the community, but not major, major news for the African Canadian community, but not major news for the public because it went under the radar. Um, not many people picked up on it. Then in 2012, Jim Rankin and Patty Winslow started the Known to Police series featuring um, all the disproportionate stops. And when you see that map, you see the shade, the darker shaded areas are areas where people of color are stopped. One cop over five years had 6,600 cards. Um, it's, it's immense to think that an officer would stop that many people who are not involved in criminal activity and demand to know who they are, where they're going, and any of their background information. That's the map again. And, I'm, and there's a lot of slides to, I'm just trying to show the picture, so I'm gonna go through them fairly quickly because of the time. But what had happened is after 2013, when you saw my first front cover, The Devastating and Unacceptable, that story, um, because it was personalized between myself and Chris Williams, who was a criminology professor, where we're both almost 40 years old, we both had never had any criminal charges in our life, we've never been arrested, yet we both had files in the police data bank. Um, Chris had one sheet um, on a stop that was illegal, and then I had 57 pages, um, which was a surprise to me. Uh, he encouraged me and said, you know, Nia, go ahead, get your information. I'm sure you'll have something, because I ran a hip-hop studio for over 20 years. So at that time, I said, okay, yeah, they probably watch. They wonder what I'm doing. And I, I was outspoken. I had ran for city council, provincial office. So I, I had a little bit of a profile, but nothing major. But once I found that information, it was, it was alarming. Um, the community, the legal community and community activists rallied around the information the STAR had presented. So now that the STAR had presented such immense data, um, the police board was forced to start making a change. And we pushed them and we now had come up in April 2014 new regulations. They were approved, which was a great success. Um, and then eventually Chief Blair suspended carding at the beginning of 2015 and said that it would not be um, allowed anymore. 
or, or accessed. But in reality, it's still continued. This article, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, um, came out in May 2015 by Desmond Cole. And this was after a year and a half of the issue being present. But again, this article, local news, made the whole story take on a new life. Um, people did not understand how black people in the city were being stopped at enormous rates. And when I was in law school, when it first broke, a lot of my colleagues came and said, Nia, I didn't know this was happening here. I thought it only happened in the US. And I was surprised. I'm like, I thought we all knew it was happening here, but it was only because I was subject of it along with the rest of the community. Our new chief, Mr. Saunders, Chief Saunders, um, supported carding. He was resistant to making any changes. Um, John Tory was in support of it for a while until a group of um, prominent Torontonians came out. And remember, I'm, I'm juxtaposing this with all the media attention that was happening. I was getting called by radio stations consistently because when we told our story, they said, this is a spin that we never heard. We never heard the detail. Usually just brush under the rug, oh, you know, most black people are criminals. They live in a high crime area. Yes, the police must stop them. What's wrong with a little stop if you have nothing to hide? Right? But when they find out people like me are being stopped over and over again, not in a high crime area, with nothing to hide but being violated, it became an issue. Tory was in support of it in the beginning, but when the group of Torontonians came out and opposed it, he said no to it. Shortly after that, um, we were fed up because when we had made the changes in 2014, they undid them in 2015. And I launched a charter challenge, which then spawned Minister Nakvi to release a statement that the Ontario government was going to stop carding and introduce new regulations. Um, once he did that, the media grabbed onto it and the whole public said, okay, carding is gonna be over. Um, then there's some Peel police information that was coming out how, how destructive it was in Peel. But then again, the Peel chief was refusing. So I'm gonna be able to answer more questions um, because my time is up, but this is a front cover when carding was the end, but then the debate still continues because even though the regulations were saying one thing, on the street it was still happening, and in the final stages of the draft regulations, community activists and lawyers said it's not enough, and we vouched, we pushed for more changes, which did happen. But this is the last slide, and it's showing um, this man still being stopped. Um, he has an enormous amount of stops. He's already sued the police and got settlements, but yet he's still stopped. So the point of what I'm just trying to say is, Local news matters because as a journalist, when you accurately report things that are of huge social interest, it, it gives the community inspiration to keep going because they say somebody's listening. And that was the point with our community. For so many years in the past, journalists would not support th this position. They always supported the police. But then when it became critical reporting, specifically Jim Rankin and Patty Windsor, um, the dialogue became open and there was a more objective lens on this. And here we go, we have major changes in, in current and um, I'm, I'm proud that you are all journalists and to be a part of this, but I'll answer more questions as we go. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nia, and thank you to all the panelists. If you wouldn't mind coming on up here. Um, we're, uh, there's lots to talk about. Um, I'm sure there are lots of questions from the audience. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, please come over to this microphone. Um, we probably have time for just a couple because um, we have to uh, head over to, um, to lunch as well. Um, I might just actually let you start since you're already there. Go ahead. The uh, speeches were great and riveting. I got uh, two questions for James Gordon. Uh, first question is how to convince the readers to pay for the content online? Because I know that if you close the newspaper down, uh, you need to earn some money in uh, a different way. So whether you tried with the paywalls or not and how successful it was. And the second question, how to fight against the trolls you mentioned? Uh, whether the changes in the law or some moderators or just uh, uh, by uh, anonymity avoidance, because uh, many times it seems that if you just register the uh, commentaries, then it's uh, much uh, low, um, uh, you know, flow from the trolls. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that. I, I wish I knew the answers. If I did, I think we'd be farther ahead in my community. Um, I think one of the things you intimated at, which I didn't mention in my presentation, is that when the the trolls prevail and when there's an absence of in-depth and even um, 
you, you mentioned investigative reporting, but that actually happened here. That's gone. Um, so if there's no alternative, when we expect that we, it's become normal that we're, we're looking at those bullet points on social media, then we've, we almost forget the value uh, of what would come from an actual paid subscription, from supporting local community papers. Um, so I think it has to get worse before it can get better. We have to really be aware of it as a community that there's a large gap there and that it's not effective to expect those free local biased sources. Uh, we, we can't look to that for our actual information. Um, and as I mentioned too, there's an education process with explaining to people the value in supporting not just uh, with your su uh, supporting from a community level, but supporting with your dollars, because um, there isn't a viable, as far maybe some of you have seen better examples, but there isn't a viable economic model for a local paper when you see the incredible onslaught of what we they say, hey, I can just get that for free. But we have to be able to say, what you're getting for free is not of the same value, and it's not a, a clear picture, it's not as relevant. So we gotta know for sure what we've lost before we can gain it back. Hi, uh, this is for Nia. Um, I'm in the Toronto media, and I, I, do you have, a, I'm, I have two questions. One is, do you have any thoughts on why this, this situation from 2002, why the carding issue, like it was out there for so long, and what, what are some of the factors that maybe made it become, finally become a big issue, an issue that, that politicians had to deal with? Um, so that's my first question. And my second one is, do you think um, the, the community, the black community, African Canadians feel they can trust the media more now because of this, or what still needs to be done to, to have a, more, a better relationship? Uh, obviously, it, we're not there completely yet, but I'm wondering, it, you know, what, and what, do you have any ideas on like, next steps in terms of um, having like, community trusting media and being able to tell their stories and that sort of thing? Yes, great questions, thank you. Uh, can I ask my question because it's related? Oh, sure. Want to add to it? Yeah, that's yeah. fine. <laughs> and it'll just be the Nia show after. <laughs> just, I guess my question is related in the sense that you had said that the media attention started uh, to pick up when people like you were highlighted, right? Yes. This idea of the non-criminal. Yes. So when the black quote-unquote criminal is covered, no one cares. So. My question is more is that, who is that media attention appealing to, right? And who are telling the stories? I'm wondering if you can comment on that. Because if it's only this kind of safe blackness hmm. that, that the stories are appealing to the Toronto community, that's a problem, right? So not only is there local news, but what is the content of that local news and who is producing it is also a very important question, right? Um, you showed Desmond Cole, look what happened to Desmond Cole two weeks ago in the Toronto Star, right? It's so indicative of what kind of local news in terms of content is accepted. Okay, so I'll answer the first two questions. So factors with um, making it a real issue that picked up, I think it was definitely the personalization of it. Um, initially, when people will tell their stories, they are community workers or community members without much of a title or profile around them. So the story comes and goes. Um, you, you combine that with the fact that the stereotypes are believed about the black community so much that they say, well, you stop a black person, so what? Most of them commit crime anyway, so mm -hmm. you know they're just doing their job. Um, but then when you get somebody like myself and Chris who have gone through that for decades in the city and have never been involved in criminal activity, and then at the same time, I become a law student at Osgoode Hall. Once those factors come out in the initial story, then the rest of the media say, oh, well, we have a credible source. We have somebody who we can ask more questions of. And then I think a lot had to do with my experiences when I was able to articulate them, then more media started coming around. Um, same thing with Desmond's stories. When he, when he wrote the Toronto Life article, you know, he talks about 50 times and all those individual stories 
people start saying, wow, that's, that's horrible. How can someone live like that? And they'd never heard those stories um, elaborated in that fashion. So that's really what started the, the s s wheel spinning. But then you combine that with all the historical activists that were still around and the lawyers still around. We were able to combine and push the issue front and center. And then you have a progressive um, chair. And then you have progressive people at the star. Like, with, honestly, without Jim Rankin and Patty Windsor taking this on and putting their necks on the line, this issue wouldn't be here. So responsible, brave journalism really made it happen. And they kept hammering away until it gave way. Um, and then second, um, to get the community to tr start trusting media more, I don't think it's that they do not trust the media so much. I think they're, they are, we are getting more trustful of the media. It's the repercussions of being on the front lines is what everyone is scared about. I've had numerous people come to me with police complaints and their stories of what has happened to them. And then the second I say, do you want to make a complaint, their response is, well, you know, what's going to happen to me? I'm going to be targeted more. And, and that's really where the hesitancy comes. I think if media started making room for anonymous reports, which I know it's not the way media likes to do it because it doesn't have a credible story, but if they were to blank out the person's identity and tell the story, that would start getting the ball rolling in that sense. Sometimes we do, sometimes we do. It's mm. like it's a process, but we can. But. Right, and then I'll follow up on the other question. Um, non-criminal, you're talking about non-criminal uh, context and why the story picked up traction. Um, I, I ran a, a hardcore rap studio for 20 years, right? Um, I dressed in track suits and had gold rings and all that. But, uh, <laughs> but I also understand a presentation. So I, I don't think it was such that the media chose someone like me in a suit and tie because Desmond doesn't wear a suit and tie and he's speaking out and we're saying the same message. I, I think it's more that the media will stick to a safe, and, and clear a message. Whereas unfortunately in the community when these things happen, it's such an emotional issue that people say things that are a little extreme sometimes and they're passionate about it. Um, it takes a really reasoned person for the media to feel safe to always go back to, to answer questions, ask questions. Yes, no, I, I, I know. And step by step now, we have to fight that going forward because we know that it's just violation of anybody's rights is, is wrong. If I could weigh in there, one of the questions was, why did the laws change? The laws changed because it was being covered in the 416 area code. Mm. I think it's really important to think for a minute that if you take northern Ontario communities that would have a very high Aboriginal population, we have no idea the extent to which carding is happening in those mm -hmm. communities and a uh, decade worth of coverage in the Thunder Bay Chronicle isn't gonna change a thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, uh, let's take our last question. Okay. Um, I'm Howard Law, I'm with Unifor, and I have a, a comment and a, maybe a solicitation at the end of the comment. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I noticed that uh, you, uh, all of your presentations overlapped on was the quality of local journalism in an age of digital disruption, in an age in which uh, business models for reliable news organizations are crumbling, and we have a lot of startups uh, and we have a lot of trolling, and we have a lot of, you know, uh, 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 we have a lot of fake news. Um, the, um, uh, you know, in, in an age which in which we need, as, as Nia might have described, you know, br more brave and responsible local journalism, uh, it's that, that sort of thing is very much in peril. Uh, it's important to document that for the public and for policymakers and. Uh, I want to, this is where I get to the solicitation part. Uh, you know, I think April has been doing fantastic work here in terms of uh, documenting news poverty. Uh, and uh, in her presentation, I think you noticed that she covered about seven or eight communities and quickly acknowledged that it was only seven or eight communities. And in order to get something, you know, more robust, you, you, you notice the presentation from Michelle about the American situation. We have uh, lots of researchers doing what April is doing by herself here in Canada. Uh, in order to make that robust, uh, you need to uh, broaden it to the number of communities, and I think you have to take on the issue of quality, mm. which is a huge amount of work, but that's, I think, what all of you have been talking about. Mm. Uh, in order to do that kind of work, April and other academics who want to do it uh, need funding. And uh, to the extent that any of you are here, 
uh, with uh, contacts and organizations that uh, have the ability to fund that kind of important work, it's vital. And it has to happen now uh, before the whole thing, frankly, uh, gets a lot worse. So that's my solicitation for today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you so much uh, to our panelists, um, Christy Hess. James Gordon, Brian Lambie, and Nia Singh. And thank you all for being here. Um, let's give them a big round of applause. Um, so next, we're headed over to um, Oakham, House, Oakham House, which is on the other side of Church Street. Um, there will be volunteers who can direct you there uh, for our lunch um, and uh, the talk with Josh Stearns of the Democracy Fund. So I'm looking forward to seeing you over there and these conversations to carry across the street. Thank you.